Jody Morgan moved into the house across the street from us when she was 14 years old. For a 15-year-old boy, it was love at first sight. There was no meet-cute. From the beginning, it seemed like we were destined to be together forever. Enough of that. What really bonded us was our shared love of adventure. We were constantly having to do things. Not just ordinary everyday things, but extraordinary things. It started with childhood fun, like climbing very tall trees or exploring caves, diving off local bridges and painting local bodies of water. Nothing seemed to be off limits unless it was illegal, although a lot of it was a bit borderline, if you know what I mean. Her favorite expression was, you always regret what you don't do. Who is Jackson Brown? It was worth a lot of work for us to graduate high school and not kill ourselves. I graduated first and got a good job laying bricks. Our school had an industrial arts program and I took full advantage of it. Jody graduated a year later. She went through the EMT training program and was quickly hired by one of the local ambulance services. Six months later, Jody Morgan became Mrs. John Terrell. Our extracurricular activities slowed down a lot but did not disappear. The excitement we lacked outside the house we made up for in the bedroom. There was nothing extra in the way of sex. We worked hard, we saved money, and bought a house. After our third son was born, Jody quit her job. Life was good. I had six people working for me, and there was more work than we could handle. Only one problem still existed. Jody was beginning to feel sorry. John, we have to do something. What, I thought everything was fine. Are the boys okay? The boys are fine for now. It's just us I'm worried about. We're at a standstill. If we don't start doing something, we'll put down roots and never be able to move again. That's an exaggeration, of course, but I see what you mean. Any suggestions? The boys are eight, nine, and ten years old. I think they're old enough to practice with us. We'll have to make some adjustments to include them, but I think it could be fun. It doesn't have to be all the time, but we have to do something. I don't want them to regret not doing something as a kid. We didn't... Jody didn't appreciate it when I started laughing. What the hell is so funny, John? You sound just like you did 20 years ago. Is this the legacy you're going to leave your sons? Well, why not? I think it's a good thing to instill in them. I want them to be more than just lumps on a log. Is that all? No, I want that for myself, too. There's a hell of a lot we haven't done yet. We can afford it, and we've got time. Your guys have your back when you need to get away. Okay, I'm in. Let's start, as they say, with a clean slate. For the next few years, we were constantly on the move. It wasn't all the time, but it was pretty regular. When one trip was over, Jody was already planning the next one, or even two. We all enjoyed rafting, and that opened a few doors. We took two trips to the Boundary Waters in Minnesota. We tried bungee jumping and zip lining. We ended up owning five kayaks. After getting our scuba certification, new doors opened up to us. We tried hot air ballooning, but found it boring. Jody and I did a tandem skydive. Ten years passed. Terry, our oldest son, joined the Air Force. Greg became a scuba instructor, and Robert, the youngest, eventually became a long-haul truck driver. Jody and I were left alone. Everything seemed to slow down. I spent more time at work, and Jody spent more time on the internet. Jody went back to work. Things were quiet for a few months. John? Yeah, I'm starting to get a little worried. What exactly does that mean? There's something I need to do. There's a lot to do at work right now. We can wait a little while. I guess so. Actually, I thought I might do something on my own for a change. You mean by yourself? Not exactly. I thought maybe with one of the girls from work, I've never gone anywhere without you, so it'll be a little different. Is there anything in particular in mind? No. Sarah and I have talked about it a bit, but haven't decided anything yet. That's Sarah Harlow? Yes, you met her at the picnics. Is that the one who's been divorced twice? Jody hesitated. Yeah, but that's not a problem. Why would it be? I'm sorry, it just seemed to me like you were being a little judgmental. Just because she's divorced doesn't make her a bad person. I didn't say that, and I'm sorry you took it that way. So you're okay with it? Of course. 
Have I ever refused you anything? Thank you. Thank you. I felt bad. All the trips and vacations Jody had planned were somehow tied to her mantra. I knew that. It remained to be seen how she would apply it in this case. She would do something so she wouldn't regret not doing it later. There's a lot of negativity here. All I had to do was figure it out. The business has grown nicely over the years. In addition to laying brick, we also did a lot of block and poured concrete foundations. We didn't do driveways or sidewalks, just foundations and poured walls. The company also did steel buildings. They were usually prefabricated buildings, but some of them were quite large. I now had over 50 full-time employees. I never asked Jody what she was planning. The fact that she wouldn't talk openly about her plans caused me some concern. I'm sure she had something on her mind. My concerns were greatly increased when I discovered that she deleted her computer browsing history every time she visited. I think most guys would have no trouble getting around this problem, but I wasn't that smart. I didn't even know what a keylogger was. She was also deleting her email, but that's where she screwed up. Jody was sending her emails to the recycle garbage can but didn't realize that they stayed in the recycle garbage can for 30 days if you didn't empty the recycle garbage can every time. I started going through her emails from the last 30 days. Most of them were the usual junk, but the correspondence with Sarah proved enlightening. The words themselves were enough to confirm my suspicions, but the web links that accompanied them made up for it. I didn't check all the sites I'd linked to. There was no need to. It was time to make a decision I would not regret. It was a Tuesday market in Boquete, and yes, it really was a Tuesday. I felt like a freshman in high school. It was my first time out, even though I've been here for two days. I wandered around town for a bit and finally found a cafe. Being old school, I ordered a regular black coffee. It was still early and people were just starting to gather, so I took one of the available seats. I felt weird wearing a New York Yankees baseball cap, but that was one of my stipulations. Hi, new guy. Welcome to Boquete. You must be Mickey, right? My greeter was also wearing a Yankees cap. I sort of half rose to greet him, but he gestured for me to sit back down and did the same. Ted Williams, always a pleasure to meet a fellow player. He shook my hand vigorously. We both laughed a little at the inappropriate reference to a ball player. I assumed it was a joke, but I got the feeling that a lot of people knew about it. How many players are we talking about? At the moment, there seem to be 10 baseball players and three tennis players. Tennis players? The baseball players are all guys, but there are three girls here as part of the program, and Hector decided tennis was a better fit for them. They're all here. All but one. Chris Everett lives in David. Just then, Sandy Koufax and Bob Feller joined us. Before the morning was over, I had met four more famous ball players. Bob quickly cut to the chase. Mr. Mickey Mantle, tell us in 25 words why you decided to choose Panama promotion alternatives. From the way the question was phrased, I guessed that no one wanted the gruesome details. A brief overview would suffice. My wife of 23 years decided she wanted to spread her wings, and I decided I didn't want to stand in her way. So I left. Yogi Berra was the first to respond. That was more than 25 words. Ted poked him in the ribs with his finger. For the next 20 minutes, each of the guys talked about their reasons for being in the program. They were almost all different, but the results were the same. Ten guys and three ladies signed up for PPA to get out of undesirable situations at home. It wasn't cheap and by no means error-free. Basically, we got a new name, a new driver's license, and a new bank account. Unfortunately, we were still U.S. citizens and had to pay taxes on our old names, all except Joe DiMaggio, who was originally from Canada. If someone wanted to find us, they could do it. Hector Ruiz organized Alternatives to Advance Panama so that people in our position would have the opportunity to disappear without going to extremes. It wasn't a black ops type system. In fact, it was pretty loose. Hector was an avid baseball fan. Things weren't exactly kosher, but it was lubricated enough to make us feel comfortable. The name change was properly processed. The driver's license and bank accounts were in order. The banking itself wasn't the easiest thing to do, but it was doable. It was almost noon when my cell phone rang. I hadn't gotten around to buying a new one yet. The whole team watched as I read the message. 
AIR Jamesia Flight 247 has landed at Philadelphia International Airport from Montego Bay. I looked at my companions and smiled. Gentlemen, my wife has just returned home from a 10-day vacation. That evening, we all went to the rock for some ribs. I spent the next few months familiarizing myself with the area. There was always one or two team members nearby for companionship and assistance. I notified all three boys of the situation, but no details. Their mother could explain everything to them. Hector insisted that all PPA members take a bag or bug-out bag with them each. Both Barry Bonds and Willie Mays had to use their bug-out bag at some point. Barry was tracked down by his irate wife, and Willie was tracked down by his two siblings. They were happy to recommend items for me to carry in case of need. The need arose sooner than I expected. The phone rang at five in the morning. Who the hell would be calling at this hour? Mr. Mantle, this is Hector. The driver will be at your place in 30 minutes. Get everything you need ready and be prepared to stay here for at least a week, maybe longer. Don't say anything to anyone. I'll take care of everything. Actually, there was nothing to do. I had just enough time to shower and shave and be ready to leave. Fortunately, the driver had brought some Aeropos with him. An hour later, we were at David's. Chris Everett was already waiting for us with a bag when we pulled up. I have no idea why she chose David over Boquette. As we drove south, there was a distinct difference in temperature. She didn't look like a tennis player at all. Of course, I didn't look like a baseball player either. She was mostly Mediterranean in appearance. We introduced ourselves to each other and she began to get settled. She'd already had breakfast and I ate her arapaz. Do you even know where we're going? I shook my head no. Don't you know why? I feigned ignorance again. She put on a dejected look and sat silent for the rest of the ride. Thirty minutes later, we docked at a small marina. I had no idea where we were. I know absolutely nothing about sailboats. All I know is that the one we found ourselves on was of medium size. After unloading us and our bags, the driver smiled, waved, and drove off. The boat was called the Yankee Clipper. I thought that was ironic. The captain, Jaime Ruiz, was Hector's cousin. His mate was a young local girl named Marisol. It turned out he ran the ship and she took care of everything else. I had no idea what we would be doing or how much we would be charged for this service. But that didn't matter. Our things were stowed in the back cabin and we gathered on deck to drink coffee and eat some cookies. It was too early for lunch. Jamie was proudly telling us about his Peterson 44. It meant nothing to me. Chris and I acted like we were interested for his benefit. I glanced at her a few times, and it was easy to see how she felt. However, he got her attention when he mentioned that we would be staying in the main cabin and he and Marisol would be in plain sight. I'm sorry, but that doesn't work for me, she said it in all seriousness. I smiled and Hamie looked a little embarrassed. I don't even know this man, and I have no intention of sharing a bed or even a room with him. You'll have to make arrangements for something else. Jamie didn't have a quick answer, so I stepped in. Don't worry about that. I can use the main bathroom, and I won't have any trouble sleeping on the folding bed in the galley. I'm sure Miss Chris won't mind me storing my bag in her room. Would you mind? Having said that, I realized that by using the expression, Miss Chris, I looked like a smartass. I would try not to make that mistake again in the future. Chris went downstairs to get settled in her room, and I wandered out onto the deck. Jamie and Marisol pulled away from the dock on the auxiliary engine. I had no idea where we were and no idea where we were going, and I didn't care. I must have dozed off because the next thing I remember is Marisol calling me to lunch. It looked like most lunches would be on the deck. I was perfectly fine with that. After a light lunch, Jamie opened a small tablet computer. Miss Everett, your ex-husband Anthony Krupe and some friends arrived in Panama City last night and rented a car this morning. All we know is that they asked the woman at the car rental place for directions to David's. Chris sank down in her chair, sighed, and said, shit. Mr. Mantle, your wife, Jody Terrell, came on the same flight from Philadelphia and rented a car as well. We don't know anything else. Marisol, do you have any cold beer? I couldn't think of anything clever to say. Thirty minutes later, Jaime and Marisol were already hoisting the sails, and soon we were hurtling full speed into the open ocean. 
Chris spent the rest of the day below while I lay on the deck, enjoying the sun and the wind. I pulled out my cold beer. The next three days were uneventful. I slept in the galley, Chris slept in the master bedroom, and Jamie and Marisol shared the forward bunk. I tried to be helpful, helping Jamie with anything and everything. Chris tutored Marisol, and she cooked some of the meals herself. She was great at brunch-type lunches. No one complained. She seemed to be comfortable in the kitchen-slash-garbage room. I spent most of my free time on the deck, except when it rained. It rained almost every day, but not all day. When we weren't sailing, Hamy found some quiet coves and bays where we could moor the boat for a while. I caught a few fish, but had no idea what kind of fish they were. All I knew was that they tasted pretty good. Chris spent time on top, but most of the time she was wearing a light blanket. She had a one-piece swimsuit that was a little modest and seemed a little old-fashioned on her. Unlike Jody, Chris was short and stocky. She wasn't fat, but she had some meat on her bones. I found that interesting, but not erotic. You know, a little sun would help you keep that nice tan. It was a weak attempt at being friendly on my part. It's not a tan, you idiot. The sun ages your skin and is one of the leading causes of melanoma. I'd rather cover up than grow old with leathery skin. That was unexpected. Her skin had a golden tint to it, and I just assumed it was from normal tanning. Apparently, she really was from the Mediterranean. Tomorrow, I would try a different approach. All was quiet and serene. Who am I kidding? It was boring as hell. By the end of the week, Chris was finally warming up. The conversations were short and meaningless, but they were conversations. That night, after dinner, we were out on the deck, and she decided to open up a little. Mickey, why are you here? What made you sign a contract with PPA? Since I decided to live in David instead of Bocate, I feel a little out of place. You guys all know each other there. That could be twofold. I'll tell you what. You tell me your story and I'll tell you mine. But there's one thing I need to know first. Yes, what is it? What is your real name? We're not supposed to talk, but what the hell? My name is Carla. Great. You can call me John. I'm not comfortable responding to Mickey. Carla reached into the refrigerator and pulled out a new long neck for both of us. I won't bore you with the long story. I got married about eight years ago in Westchester to the son of an old family friend. I guess you could call it a marriage of convenience, although technically it wasn't. My family was fairly well off, and so was his family. Unfortunately, I couldn't have children, so my husband decided he needed to look elsewhere. Do you agree with me? I smiled nodded, and took a sip of my beer. My family, the Randazzos, were in the municipal construction business. They maintained all the traffic lights, street lights, storm sewers, and other such projects in three counties. It was very profitable. The Krupe family owned four restaurants, several pizzerias, and sandwich stores. And how did you end up here? My husband Tony casually informed me that he was having a baby with his last girlfriend. He was going to move her into our house while she was pregnant, and after the baby was born, they would find a more suitable place to live. He seemed to be very confident. He's always been like that. She brought us two more cold ones. I smiled and waited for her to continue. I burned down the house and three cars. Then I burned down the biggest of Krupe's restaurants and finally cleaned out all the bank accounts, including savings and investments. Two days later, I was here. We sat in silence for a few minutes, enjoying our beers. Okay, John, now it's your turn. My wife Jody and I met when we were kids. We grew up together and were always getting into trouble. She enjoyed every minute of it. Her mantra was, you always regret what you don't do, and she lived up to it. In time, we got married and had three children. I started my construction business, which was doing very well. Every chance we got, we were doing something adventurous and exciting. As the kids grew up, she got bored and decided to have one of her own ventures. Because of the nature of the project she chose, I couldn't go with her, and also, unfortunately, she couldn't discuss it with me. Carla handed me a new cold beer. I think I see where this is going. I'm not a computer wizard, but I had no trouble figuring it out. It was really bothering me. I don't know what was worse, knowing what she was going to do or knowing she was keeping it a secret from me. We've shared everything all our lives, and now it was going to happen. I take it you waited until she was gone before you left? Yes. 
I gave my business to the employees in exchange for a share in future profits and took a good chunk of our savings, but not all of it. I left her the house and everything else. Are you sure she did what you thought she did? No. I don't want to know, and I don't need to know more than I know. I don't need this grief. Have you heard anything of her since then? No. We sat in silence for a while, and then Carla left and went to bed. I slept on deck that night. The next day, there was some kind of storm. By supper time, it was getting pretty bad. Hamy and Marisol spent a lot of time getting the lines and anchors or something like that ready for the night. They seemed to know what they were doing, so I felt at ease. All I could think about were the lyrics from an old song by the band Queen. Thunder and lightning, very, very scary. Galileo, Galileo. I don't know what was worse, the bright flashes or the loud peals of thunder. It was hard to sleep, and the fact that Carla kept shaking me wasn't helping. What the hell do you want? This storm is really bad, John. Come down to the cabin with me, quickly. It's okay. I'm all right. Don't worry about me. Come back to bed. I'm not worried about you, asshole. I'm worried about me. Get your ass back to the cabin now. She tugged on my arm. I spent the rest of the night hugging her. Most of the time, she pulled the blanket over her head. By the next morning, all was quiet and peaceful. I woke up with my breasts in my hand and fierce excitement. She seemed awake and aware of both states, but didn't know what to do and just lay there unmoving. Smoothly, as smoothly as I could, I pulled my ass back and removed my hand. I can't imagine how it ended up under my nightgown. When we were settled on the bed, she turned to face me. Thank you, John. I needed that. She slid off the bed and walked over to my head. I had no idea what she meant. I slumped over the side with relief. The rest of the day, Carla was very friendly. Jamie and Marisol enjoyed making us feel bad about our night together. The comments and teasing didn't stop all day. Carla didn't seem to be left out herself either. I was more embarrassed than she was. In the evening, after a few beers on deck, Carla took my hand and we went to the cabin together. We didn't get much sleep that night. It was a new experience for me. My first woman other than Jody. Everything was different, but it was also old. It's hard to describe, but I really enjoyed it. I didn't feel any guilt. Unfortunately, it was also our last night aboard the Yankee Clipper. On the way home, our driver gave us an update. It seems that Jody had left Boquete after a week and had returned home. Carla's husband, however, had just disappeared along with his two companions. The rental car was found in the middle of nowhere, but there were no people in it. We dropped Carla off at her apartment, and an hour later I was home. The first person I met the next morning was Billie Jean King. She had spent most of the week with Jody while I was away. Jody had spent a couple days posting my picture around town. It didn't take her long to realize that I was now Mickey Mantell. Other than the PPA guys, no one was hiding anything from me. They just didn't have any information to give her other than where I lived. When she realized I wasn't coming back, she gave up and left. She didn't say much, but she revealed to Billie Jean that I left because she screwed up. That's all she said. Nothing much, but again, it was secondhand. However, if she really felt that way, then my leaving was the right decision. Things went pretty normally for the next few months except that I spent two or three days a week in David and Carla spent a couple days a week in Boquete. There was never a deep emotional attachment between us. It was just a beautiful friendship. Eventually, she decided I wasn't going to move to David and found us a bigger and better apartment in Boquete and we teamed up. Carla decided to take up watercolor painting and I got serious about sports. So serious that Willie Mays, Sandy Koufax and I decided to open our own gym a gym, so to speak. It was a fun project. A lot of expats in the area had unused exercise equipment that wasn't being used. It's funny how people buy these things without realizing that they don't work if you don't use them. In a short time, we had more exercise equipment than we needed. More than half of them were not up to the quality of the exercisers, and eventually we had to get rid of them. No one was offended by this. They just wanted to get rid of them. Monica Seles was very happy that we opened so she could start yoga and Zumba classes. We charged a small monthly fee to cover rent, utilities, and insurance. Business at the gym was going well, and Carla was excited about her painting. Other than that, however, things were not so rosy. 
PPA turned out to be a bucket of worms. Hector tried his best to get things up and running and keep things running, but it was all too complicated. Several guys had problems with their passports. The tax situation was confusing. Oddly enough, the banking operations were somewhat confusing. After several group meetings, it was decided to drop the program. This was agreed to by everyone except Joe DiMaggio. Hector agreed to make an exception for him. It took a few weeks, but eventually everyone got new driver's licenses and bank accounts. Our old passports were still valid. The only downside now was that it would be easier for someone to find us. We still kept Hector as our legal advisor and trustee. We also kept our bug out bags with us just in case. A year went by and I didn't even notice it. The checks still came every month. The amounts varied, but always more than enough. The good thing was that Carla had a lot more money than I did, and she didn't skimp. We lived well and didn't need anything. Since I had last called Jody and my sons, I had no contact with them. The next six months were pretty active. One day I came home and found Carla sitting on the porch with a stranger. Michael Randazzo had come from Westchester to spend a week with his daughter. They hadn't spoken since she left. Her mother couldn't make it because of heart problems. I started to feel a little uneasy, but he quickly put me at ease. He was genuinely grateful that his daughter was happy and being taken care of. I felt a little uneasy, especially since I was almost 20 years older than her. Over the next week, Michael and I spent several hours together. He apologized for letting the problem with Carla's husband get out of hand. He never said it, but I had formed the opinion that Anthony Krupe had never returned to the States and never would. I didn't bother to demand an explanation. It was his monkey and his circus. He tried to get the charges against Carla dropped, but was unsuccessful. He also questioned me about my marital status and seemed genuinely interested in my answer. The week passed quickly. Carla was happy and I was benefiting from it. Before he left, he pulled me aside. John, Carla needs to see her mother. She can't go back as Carla Krupe, but she can do it as Carla Terrell. Think about it. I took that as his approval. Six weeks later, I got another surprise. My son Greg showed up. You're hard to find, Dad, but not impossible. And then I'm sorry I haven't kept in touch, but I assume you're aware of the situation. Actually, Dad, none of us know. We've all tried, but Mom refuses to tell us anything. All she says is that it was her fault and nothing else. <laughs> it's been over a year and I still haven't heard from her. She showed up over a year ago, and I avoided her the whole time she was here. I was still very raw at the time. From what, Dad? Are you going to give us a clue? No, I've said too much already. Now what the hell are you doing here? Do you know where Boca del Toro is? Of course I do. It's about five hours north of here. Why? I bought 50% of the stock in the dive store. I'm here to do the paperwork. I'll be moving in next month. How's your mother doing? And she was depressed for a while, but then she found a new job. She works in the cafeteria at the junior high school. She tried to sell the house, but couldn't without your signature, so she rented it out and got an apartment. We talked to her about getting a more prestigious job, but she got upset and told us to mind our own business. With the rent on the house and her salary, I think she's doing okay. At that moment, Carla walked in. It was obvious that she lived here, and neither of us thought to hide it. Hi, you must be Greg. John tells me a lot about you. Greg was surprised, and it was evident on his face. Carla laughed. It's okay, Greg. Just think of me as your father's housekeeper. Who wants a beer? She knew how to melt ice. Greg suddenly felt comfortable with the situation. We talked some more and then went to dinner. Before Greg left back to the States, I gave him power of attorney so Jody could sell the house. He came back a month later to start a new business. Since I left, I haven't had any contact with the business. That was the plan. The checks kept coming in and I had no reason to pry. After a few months, I noticed that my monthly contributions to the company had increased significantly. I left Gary Jones in charge of the company and felt it was time to make some inquiries about him. Gary, this is John. Shit, it's about time. You've been gone for almost two years. What's going on? I was going to ask you the same question. I saw a big jump in the monthly checks and I got curious. Is there something I should know about? A couple months ago, we had a company from Philadelphia called 
Empire Industries come to visit us. Have you ever heard of them? Of course I had heard of them. Empire Industries was owned by the Randazzo family. It must have all happened shortly after I met Carla's father. Yes, I've heard of them. I know one of the owners, Michael Randazzo. What happened that led up to this? They explained to us that they had gotten a lot of different jobs that didn't fit into their normal operations. They wanted to subcontract these jobs and asked if we would be interested in doing that. We didn't see anything wrong with that suggestion, so we agreed to try it for 90 days. It worked out great. We got a lot of new work in Chester and Montgomery counties, and I had to hire 12 more people. I also had to buy three more trucks and some other equipment. Is everything under control or do you need help? John, everything is under control, but we'd like you to come back. I haven't had a day off since you left. I could use a week ashore. We both laughed a little at his suggestion. Gary, let me think about it for a while. I'll call you back. I heard him smirk on the other end of the wire. Gary, did Jody come by at all? To be honest, John, she's only been here once. About a week after you left, she showed up. I explained to her that you were no longer associated with the company, just like you told me. I know she wanted to know more, but couldn't bring herself to ask. She wasn't crying or upset. Looked a little sad, nothing more than that. We never saw her again. I had a light but serious conversation with Carla that evening, and she swore she knew nothing about what her dad had done. She did, however, find it amusing. Months went by and everything was going well. At Christmas, I was in for a surprise when Terry showed up. Greg had shared everything with both brothers, but had carefully kept most of it from his mother. Of course, she knew where I was, and I'm sure she suspected that Greg and I were dating since he was in Panama, too. It's just that he never shared anything with her, and she never asked. Terry spent two days with me and Carla in Boquete, and the rest of the time in Bocas del Toro with Greg. Greg promised that while he was here, he would get his scuba recertification. Terry brought two things that Jody wanted him to give to me. The first was a check for $210,000, my share of the sale of the house. That was her decision, not mine. The second thing was the final divorce decree. There was no letter, no explanation, no message, just two envelopes. When he left, I had no message or letter for him to pick up. It was closed. I had no regrets whatsoever. Two months later, Carla Terrell got a new passport and traveled with her new husband to her mother's house. It was a round-trip ticket.